Do you ever find yourself searching for something bigger than you? For a community to be a part of? A place founded on truth and love. A place to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Son of God. Welcome to Founded in Truth, where we're more than just a fellowship. We're a family, so welcome home. Bat Shalom, everybody. I've been, I've been entertaining doing sermon illustrations for the past few weeks, you know, with the weed whacker and the sledgehammer, and I've been enjoying it more than you guys, I promise. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, let me get set up. I'm just going to set this microphone down right here. And uh, for those of you who know me and know... Um, The types of things I like to study and certain things and certain directions I I feel are more edifying than others. Um, There we go. That's going to be perfect. Uh, You know that I'm not a huge fan of talking about eschatology a lot. And uh, end of the world is coming and what do we do and how we prepare. And that's just not... I've been, I guess, in this walk for 15 years, and I've lived through the end of the world five times. And I don't, I don't even get a T-shirt. Like it's, <laughs> and so it's really, in, in my journey, I shifted towards a very apathetic view about the end times um, to the point where it was unhealthy. I mean, you know, oh, and the world's coming now. I don't care, whatever. I mean, it might. I don't, everyone's going to die. It's fine. I mean, just apathetic. Uh, whereas before, I was very extreme in my views. Guys, listen, I watched this YouTube video, and this guy's legit, and the video had a lot of really good music, thump, epic music in it, and, and, and the end of the world is coming next summer in 2013, Daniel's timeline, and then Daniel's timeline revisited, and all this stuff. And, and I, don't, I study eschatology. I love reading resources about it. I love diving into the uh, sphere or the scope of Christian academia when it comes to the end time stuff, but I don't talk about it uh, a lot here. And today, many of you might think that I'm going to talk about the end times today, but I'm not. Why did you give that big intro? Because some of you may think that I'm going to talk about the end times today based on the scriptures that we're reading. Um, If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to start there, and can we dive into the scriptures today? a question because you don't have a choice. So we're going to dive into the scriptures today, and I hope that uh, I've, I've, I've set the workflow out for this message in a way that you can, I'm not losing people, and I'm not, uh, I hope I was efficient in how we're going to jump around, because we're going to jump around today, and it's going to be fun to experience the teachings of Yeshua and what he gave to us through the records of the Gospels. So Matthew 25, does anyone have any one of those Bibles that has the, the red letters? Like when all the words of Yeshua and the red letters. I love that. So when you turn to chapter 25, uh, do you see a lot of red? It's like an ocean, a sea, a tsunami of red, right? And, um, and this is one of the chapters in Matthew. Uh, there's several, but it's a huge collection of his teachings. It's a very valuable chapter. And we're going to start in uh, verse 1. And da, 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 da. I'm going to save that. So verse 1, we're going to start, and you'll notice it's a very familiar parable. And we're kind of continuing our parable series today, and uh, we'll just start reading. Verse, Matthew 25, verse 1, Yeshua is speaking, and he says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil in them. But the wise took flasks of oil in their lamps, and the bridegroom was delayed. So they became kind of drowsy, and they slept, all of them. But at the midnight, there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins rose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Like, we got a problem. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yours. Like, go get your own oil. We can't give you ours. 
And, um, and while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, everybody say ready, ready. went in with him to the marriage. So, Matthew 23, verse 36. And I have it here, if you didn't bring your scriptures today. Um, one thing that we support here at Founded in Truth Fellowship is BYOB. Bring your own Bible um, each week, and we encourage you to do that. And so he says, truly I say to you, so this is a chapter that's filled with Yeshua, and he's in where? What city's in it? He in this chapter. Jerusalem. And he's rubbing up against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leadership in Jerusalem, and he's getting himself in trouble because he's making these proclamations about the kingdom of God that are radical. And the way that he's walking out this supposed kingdom of God that's birthing now onto the earth is something that is totally opposed to the way the Pharisees think and how they interpreted Torah and the way that the Sadducees think and how they're trying to work out Torah and how the Essenes think and how everybody thinks. And it's just rubbing everybody the wrong way. And then finally Yeshua like loses it on the Pharisees. He just like lets them have it. Like you whitewash white, sepulchre. you just dead inside. You look pretty on the outside. Just a bunch of dead bones on the inside, you know, spirit. Like, what do you do? And he just lets them have it. And then he gets to verse 36. And truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And then he laments over this city. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what's he kind of saying about Jerusalem? Good things? Bad things? The temple's going to be destroyed. You're going to lose the shrine that you've lifted up and you say that you're righteous because you, you, you go to the shrine every day and you do these things and his shrine's turned into a den of robbers. Like, what, do you, what have you done to the faith of our father Abraham? And so I want you to know that going forward with this message, what my influences are, I didn't just make this stuff up. I do a lot of reading. I do not naturally know stuff. Um, there are some people who God may download information into their heads. Johnny Mnemonic, that old 80s movie. Anyway, um, that, that would be great if that happened to me, right? God, I pray for this information. That would be great. I don't have that ability, so I read books and I depend on Christian men and Christian scholars who I've come to trust. And one of those scholars is uh, named Professor Nicholas Thomas Wright. Uh, he is a pretty big name as far as Christian academia goes. He's a New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright. Lots of books. Love his books. Um, another scholar that uh, I'm very impressed with and uh, I love listening to his teachings. He's a professor. He has a doctorate in, in ancient languages. Uh, professor uh, Tim Mackey. He's the He's the founder of that, that, the Bible Project. If you don't know what the Bible Project is, go to YouTube, type in the Bible Project, and wow, um, this free resource online. And also Frederick Murphy and his views on apocalyptic literature, poetry, uh, and apocalypticism, um, the worldview of apocalyptic thought, if you will. So yeah, so now we're done with chapter 23. Now we can start the chapter. So Yeshua is talking. And it says, Yeshua left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. All right? Ooh, ah, all right? Look at these beautiful things. Look what Herod has done. He's expanded this temple mount. Look at these. I mean, they, they, they probably have not had that much exposure to the temple. In the first century, Judeans outside of Judea, Jews outside of Judea didn't come to every single feast. It was very difficult to do that. Could you go to Jerusalem for every single feast with your job and supporting your family? It might be difficult to imagine that being a whole nation. Uh, the Jews in Babylon would have had to travel three months one way to go to the temple. So when the you know, disciples came, fishermen, they're like, wow, this place is amazing. Like They may have seen it before, but they're just amazed at the house of God that Herod has poured into. But he answered them, Yeshua, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. I'm popping that bubble. Verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Did they ask him one question, or did they ask him two? That word and is a Greek word, kai. And guess what it means? 
and, and. And so the disciples ask him two questions. Um, number one is when will these things happen? And what things? The things that he just got done talking about. The temple's going to be destroyed and Jerusalem's going to be overthrown, right? And, and he just mentioned this twice. And the second question that they add in, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, in this chapter, this chapter is divided up essentially, if I can minimize it and just divide it up into two sections, you have verses 4 through 35, which deal with answering the first question, and then you have uh, verses 36 through 51, which deal with answering the second. And we're, we're going to go over that. In verse 33 is when he, he comes to the conclusion of answering question number one, and we're going to go back in, in just a second. So, so answer to question number one, he answers in, in Matthew 24, 33, so also when you see all these things, what things? Things that he just told us in the past few verses, um, 30 verses, the things, you know that he or it is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these have come to place. Um, so he's speaking about Jerusalem falling. And how many of your scriptures say he there? You know he is near. Why are you pointing this out, Matt? Because later you'll understand. How many of your scriptures say he in Matthew 24, verse 33? It's important. I want to know. I'm curious. Nobody? How many of you are... It says he? Okay. No? Does it say it? Or he. or he. It's beautiful because there's no Greek word here. It's an assertion. So older manuscripts like the King James Version will have it. Newer manuscripts uh, assert that the past few chapters he was talking about his coming and they put he in there. Um, this is the debate. And if, you're not, uh, if, you, if you haven't caught on what debate this is, you will shortly. This is the debate about this chapter. And so what's he say here in verse 34? He says, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Okay. How long is a generation? What's a good biblical term for a generation? We could do 70 years. 40. Who said 40? Who said 40? Who said 40? Don't be afraid. 40. Some would say 20. Um, Numbers chapter 32, verse 13. If you allow me to assert this this is the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for how many years? Why? Until the whole generation of those who had done evil in the sight were gone. So would it be too much to assert 40 years here, speculatively? Um, guys, this happened. When he was speaking, it was either, depending on what timeline you're on, it was either 30 A.D. or 33 A.D., this happened either 37 years or 40 years after Yeshua spoke these words. Jerusalem was destroyed. In 66 A.D., the zealots picked up arms. In 70 A.D., the temple was overrun. Every stone was toppled. In 74 A.D., the mass suicide at Masada took place when the Romans banged down the door at the last remaining rebellion, and everybody had killed themselves. Now, he's going to answer question number two. What was question number two? What is the sign of your coming? The end of the age when God's kingdom, the realm of fullness of the habitation of God, fully engulfs this world that we live in, and the climax of God's restoration is complete. When does that happen? Yeshua takes this up. I think I have it. In verse 36. But concerning the day... And the hour, no man knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So you see that word, but? You guys want to learn how to say that in Greek? De. De. Everybody say de. de. It's a one T, but. One T. De. But concerning what day? The day of his coming, no man knows the day or the hour. So Yeshua is like, the first question is going to happen sometime in the next 40 years. What about the sign of your coming? I don't have a clue. <laughs> No, no. I don't know. The angels don't know. Only my Father in heaven knows, which I know opens up a can of another whole other discussion, which guess what? We're just going to keep that can closed because we're not discussing that today. But he doesn't know. And so Yeshua is pretty clear that the first question, that this generation will see the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. But the second question, Yeshua is like, I don't know. And he expounds his answer to that in the remainder of the chapter. Now, this chapter is filled with a lot of interesting verses. It has a lot of uh, history. It sparked many 
Um, many enormous ideas of speculation and theories and opinions, if you've ever read this chapter. And, and I'm just going to be clear. I don't think Yeshua, when he was explaining and teaching his disciples, chapter 24 of Matthew, he was giving us some type of timeline or prophecy chart to fill out. I think he was giving us pastoral encouragement of how we're supposed to act when we go out in the world and we find out the reality that it is broken. And so one thing we have to do, and I would petition you to do, is to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to the Scriptures and what the Scriptures say. And we also have to humble ourselves that Jesus was not speaking English. And that Jesus was not speaking in a way... Matthew is not writing this account like a Facebook note or like a YouTube video or like our type of language would be to how to communicate with each other. Um, Yeshua was a Hebrew prophet, was he not? I would assert the, with a capital T, the Hebrew prophet, the one greater than Moses, right? And so the one thing about Hebrew prophets is they loved to use hyperbole and extreme exaggeration to get points across. Uh, apocalyptic literature, such as we see in Daniel and Revelation, with the monsters coming out of the pit, and you got this four-eyed thing with big horn and whatnot, and it was just all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, apocalypse doesn't mean end of the world. It means to be revealed. So Revelation, that's the, Revelation is apocalypse, the Greek word for apocalypse, apocalypsios, I may have butchered that. The book of Revelations is the Greek word apocalypse, but it's the revealing, right? And typically it has to do with the end of the world, but it always has to do with revealing something about the cosmos of time and God's plan from an angle that is very poetic and emphasized and exaggerated. Um, and so I'd like to give you an example of a, of a prophet that uses proto-apocalyptic literature, which means he uses a lot of exaggeration and tons of hyperbole, but elements of apocalyptic literature, and that would be Isaiah. So I'm gonna, we're going to read Isaiah 13. Can we read this? So I want you to turn to, if you're going to turn to Isaiah 13, don't read the first verse. And everyone's like, what's the first verse? Go to verse 2. Put your finger over it. Don't read the first verse. All right? And let me dramatically read this, I believe, in the way that it was meant to be read. Will you allow me this? Thank you. On the bear here, raise the signal. Cry aloud to them. Wave the hand for them that enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exalted ones. The sound of the tumult is on the mountains as of a great multitude, the sound of the uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land and the end of heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Well, for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the almighty. It will come. Therefore, all hands will be fever. Every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman giving birth, in birth pains, labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Did I do that dramatic enough? Is that good? So I want us to read this chapter. And this bloom represents the anticipation, the passion, and the energy that the prophet puts into defining this pseudo-apocalyptic moment in time. This end of the world as we know it, where the universe is going to cease functioning because it is the day of who? The day of the Lord. Now go ahead and look at verse 1. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw.
This didn't have to do with the end of the world? Well, that's anticlimactic. <laughs> Mingled in. Has to do with Babylon. The chapter continues speaking about how God is going to raise up the Medes, the Persians, to come and overtake the land. But when we read this, we read it as Babylon. But what do we also see infused in it? Like an end of the world scenario? Anyone else? Like, yeah, this could be about the end of the world because of the language. Exactly. Welcome to how ancient Hebrew prophets write. It's like they're describing painting a house. You're going to paint your house. But they, they can't hold back the, the poetry and the passion of God's vision. And so they go ahead and they intertwine. you painting the house, this, this event that's very near, with the fact that one day the house is going to rot and fall apart and collapse. Or maybe you're going to sell it. And just the whole scape, the whole scope of the cosmic universe of God's creation is mingled in around this event that's going to happen. So does it have to do with the event or things that happen after the event too? Exactly. The sun did not literally go black when the Medes took out Babylon. The stars did not fall to the earth. I mean, if, just, if it was singular, it'd be over. No need to even make it plural. I mean, if the sun hits us, you know. The moon did not stop shining its light. Well, it's exaggeration to get a point across. This day is going to be so awesome when God raises up this army of the Medes to overtake Babylon. It will be such an awe-striking moment of God. It will be as if the universe stops functioning for this moment. Hmm. Yeshua used exaggerations a lot. You guys realize that? Pluck your eye out. <laughs> or, well, chop your hand off. I am the bread of life. Eat me. Hmm. So we need to check our assumptions because this is an entirely different culture that we're journeying into. And so let's just read Matthew 24 and see where it takes us. Starting in verse 4. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. What question is he answering? When will the destruction of Jerusalem come? The first question. And how long will that roughly, like how long do we have before that happens? A generation. All y'all, you guys are going to see it. Next generation. And he's saying that things are going to get pretty bad. And there are people that will come and declare, yeah, that Yeshua failed, remember? He was killed. He was crucified. We know the story. He, was, he, was, he died and someone stole his body. There is no hope. But wait, I'm the Messiah. I'm the messianic king that's here to deliver you. Don't worry. Follow me. Not, not, not the leader of the past. Just follow me. And we know that many messiahs did stand up after the ascension of Yeshua. And they had great followings. The most uh, notable is, of course, uh, Simon ben Kosova or Simon ben Bar-Kokhba, ben Kar- Simon bar Kokhba, uh, son of the star, labeled by Rabbi Akiva. This was Rabbi Akiva's Mashiach, Mashiach Messiah. And he led the revolt uh, the third final revolt against the Romans and this insurgency. And um, it was fascinating because he stood up and everyone thought he was a Messianic king because he had this passion. And he said, the kingdom of God is here for the taking. Pick up your sword. Let's take it from the Romans and we will be free and I will be essentially your king. That's how people perceived him. In the book of Acts uh, chapter 5, there's several other false messiahs that are mentioned. Sanhedrin's pulling their hair out. They're like, all right, I got these, these, these. And you're going to see war take place, war here in Judea and war from afar, and there's going to be famine. Acts 11 records this famine um, during the time of Claudius Caesar. 
and earthquakes, and guys, it's going to get bad. You're going to see all this stuff get bad. And what is the advice that Yeshua gives us? If you don't remember anything else, remember this from this message. Do not be afraid. Do not be alarmed at this. The world is a broken place, so don't get upset when you realize that the world is a broken place. Don't freak out, because it's going to get bad. And I know you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff on Facebook and on CNN and on Fox News. And guys, don't even watch InfoWars. Just please don't. Right? You're going to see all this stuff, that, all this stuff, these rumors. That... Stay focused on what I'm sending you out to do. Don't freak out. It's not the end. Yeshua takes a moment and compares it to birth pains. And it's the same thing we see in Isaiah 13, birth pains. How many people have given birth in here? I have not. Yeah. Got a couple of people at home because they just gave birth. Hey. Right. Did it hurt? I mean, is there a pain associated with? I don't know. I mean, right? There's a pain. And it's horrible, right? Like, it's a horrible pain, and, like, it leads to something horrible, right? What comes from birth pain? New life, something beautiful, something you anticipate. This is the birth pains, God. The birth pains for what? For the completion of the restoration of the kingdom of God. And it's going to be amazing, but these things have to happen first. Verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray because of lawlessness will be increased. And the love of many will grow cold. Now, which question is Yeshua answering? We've got to stay on track. The first one, he's still continuing. We haven't gotten to the dead yet, the but yet. When will Jerusalem fall? This is what he's answering. So the disciples are going to be sent well. Where? Matthew 28. He sends everybody out where? Where do they go? To all what? And he's saying that when you get to all nations, you're going to be hated by all nations. Because there's going to be people that are going to love this message, but there's going to be people that think it's stupid, and they're going to hate you for it. They're going to think you're crazy for it. This anticipation of this new world being birthed through us as the ambassadors of this king, you're nuts. And they'll kill you, and they will torment you, but don't lose heart. And be careful, because he goes on, he says, there will be many within the circle of believers that will fall away and hate one another. And then false prophets and teachers will begin to infiltrate the circle and lead many astray. Why? Because of what? Lawlessness. And what is the context of lawlessness here? Their love will grow cold. And false teachers will claim to follow Yeshua, but they will have a religious or a selfish agenda. And you guys can always, like an agenda that's shrouded, painted, painted with Yeshua, but in its core it's not about Yeshua. And you can always tell what that is or who that is by looking at their fruit and also what do they put their energy into. What do people put their energy into defines what their goals are. If someone spends all of their time speaking about the dangers of the secret Illuminati and not the birth of the kingdom of God, it might be something to keep an eye on. Watch out. There's a ton of this stuff coming, guys, is what Yeshua is saying. And so, something that, uh, I love this because it's something when I was, when I was uh, reviewing uh, Professor Mackey's overview of this chapter, he, he said something. He says, when you read this section of verses here, and this is important, when you read this section of verses, does this seem like something that just happened 2,000 years ago? Or does it seem like something that like, happened last month? Or 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Yes. Would you like to know why? Because Yeshua was a prophet, 
and he wrote like a prophet. And just because he was defining something that was happening near doesn't mean that the way that he put it didn't have shockwaves and was going to define what we're going to be going through for generations. People get so bent out of shape. Like, like people think that their generation is so significant because they read this and they look in the news and they're like, oh, this is it. Like this, I'm living in the time of prophecy and this is when the return is coming and this is the generation and this has been happening to every generation for the past 2,000 years. And you are living in a time of prophecy, but not in the context like you're thinking. Yeshua was a prophet. Verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And then the what? So what has to happen first? The declaration has to go out to all nations. Endure till the end will be saved. Those who endure to the end will be saved. The one who is very intentional with his or her walk the one who is not led into this extremist view or someone who has, like, produces extreme measures in their, in their life because of this perception of the world and they get distracted and not the one who gets so apathetic about the world because they're just tired of it and whatever and I'll just go to heaven when I die and whatnot. No, 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 no. Those who endure, those who are focused, those who understand that their mission was not to be, what? Afraid but to stay focused and be encouraged that these are the birth pains of what is happening with the kingdom and it is coming. And if we stay focused, then the kingdom will be birthed through us, just like Yeshua taught us. The one who holds on to what Yeshua has said. Not the one who walks like the Pharisees. Not the one that walks like the Pharisees. Not the one that walks like the Romans. The one that walks after Yeshua. Stay focused. And he's not even like, <laughs> like trying to, to, to get someone to think that they need to go out and like get a disciple of the year award, like I saved the most people. No, he's just like, dude, just hang on. Just hang on. And don't get distracted. What's the number one mission that we have, according to Yeshua? To L O V E. To love who? God, to love God, and to love who else? This is important. Our neighbor. This is the spear tip of God's kingdom. This is the pointy tip. The spear that you thrust out. I'm using a violent analogy. I know. So, the spear that you thrust out to portray the kingdom of God and what Christ has done in you, what Yeshua is doing through you. The pointy tip of that, the most important, important aspect of it, Yeshua says, is loving God and loving your neighbor. The pointy tip of God's Torah is loving God and loving your neighbor. And if the pointy tip of the spear is not loving God and loving your neighbor, it is not the Torah of God, according to our king. And here Yeshua emphasizes the destruction of Jerusalem is not the end of the world. It's not. The good news of the gospel of Yeshua that the king of Israel has been given all authority in heaven and earth, that the king, Yeshua, has died for us, that he was raised to life and we were raised to life in him, that he has defeated sin and death, and that a new world is being birthed, the world where God reigns. This needs to go out to all nations. And that's your job, is to be an ambassador of the king, Christos, Christ, Yeshua, and then the end will come. And how long is that going to take? At least 2,000 years, I mean. Like on one end you have folks that read this chapter, and I used to be one of them, and they get their prophecy charts out. Has anybody ever had a prophecy chart? Like, right, you got the prophecy chart, and you have the timetables, and the Antichrist is going to come here, and Planet X is going to hit here, Right? And this is all going to happen on the, the prophecy chart. 
And this mindset is based on speculation and fear. Fear. And there are many organizations that bank off of this fear and speculation that we have. You guys realize, you guys know how YouTube works? So the more views someone gets on YouTube, the more money they make. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so you can have a video that says how to know Yeshua through his Torah and how to know the kingdom of God and how to have an intimate relationship. And you have about 300 views. And then you have a video, Planet X is approaching in one month, 40 million views. <laughs> Fear. Because we want to watch the video. Oh, is the end coming? And we watch it. Oh, my gosh, the end is coming. And then we almost trust the guy telling us these things that are making us scared because obviously he has everything in a basket and he's going to tell us how to be prepared. Anybody? No, just me. Okay. So, and then there are those who become apathetic about the world. I'm just tired of all that. What of a sensationalism. As that was, this is my journey. And this is equally offensive to the message of Yeshua. Because Yeshua cared about God's creation. Hate to break it to you. The story of the Bible is not about us leaving earth and going somewhere else. It's about staying here and ushering in the somewhere else to here. Creation. And we were charged to make sure creation was tended to. I heard one, one, uh, one professor say that littering is a spiritual issue. If we are the ones that are supposed to take care of creation and that was the mandate in the garden, stand firm. <laughs> Bear witness to Yeshua coming, to Yeshua living, to Yeshua dying, and to Yeshua's resurrection. That is what Yeshua is saying here. Verse 15. Okay, we're, still, we're still connected. So when you see the abomination of desolation... Spoken of by the prophet Daniel. By who? Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. I'm going to stop here. Because Yeshua is not the one saying, let the reader understand. This is Matthew. Matthew's like giving us a hint. And he's saying like, listen guys, if you haven't caught, got, got with the program yet, you're not going to understand what Yeshua's talking about unless you go back and read Daniel and the other prophets. And, um, and what was the question that Yeshua's still answering? When is Jerusalem going to be destroyed and the temple destroyed and overthrown, right? Battle took place in 66 AD. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And 74 was the end of this second revolt, and it led into the second century. Here, I got some pictures. There we go. So we were archaeological digging, and we found the stones to the temple complex. And here they are laying under the temple mount. There's another one took the Romans like weeks to do this. I mean, it wasn't like go destroy the temple. Like it was a construction. It cost money and resources for the Roman Empire to sit there and lever off these huge stones off the temple mount. Bah, bah. We conquered you. Who, 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 right? Just heavy, huge stones. This is the size of people, bigger than people. Josephus talks about some. And when Yeshua was talking about the abomination of desolation, what do you guys think of? We just went through the festival that spoke about it. Hanukkah, right? When the Greeks came in and they set up a statue of Jupiter or Zeus on the Temple Mount, and this was the abomination that made desolate. So Josephus writes about what took place, and this is uh, Wars of the Jews 6 in chapter 6, so it's real easy to find, 6 and 6. Um, not a third one, just two. And now the Romans, upon the flight, seditious into the city, and upon the burning of the holy house itself, and all the buildings round about brought their ensigns to the temple and set them over against its eastern gates. And there they did offer sacrifices to them. And there they did make Titus imperator with the greatest acclamations of joy. The Romans came in and they destroyed the temple. And they set up these symbols with an eagle on them, representing the might of Rome, specifically giving honor to Zeus. It happened again. And they made sacrifices to Zeus for helping them conquer, or Mars for helping them conquer and win this battle. The abomination of desolation. That just, I mean, is the same thing that took place just two centuries earlier with the Maccabees. 
Then let those who are in Judea flee from to the mountains. Get out of Dodge. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not go back to get his cloak. And alas for the women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that their flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbaths, because it's going to be tough. Everybody good so far? I'm talking a lot today. I'm, just, I'm kind of excited because I want to get to the point of the message. And, and the point of this message has to go back to the parable of the ten virgins, which we'll get to in a minute. So Yeshua is describing what took place when Jerusalem was destroyed and all of the followers in it, his followers, in Judea, went where? Left. Run, right? Run away. It's fascinating because we see Jewish writings. I know um, Samuel Dakiaki wrote about this in his book. Uh, with, with some of the Jewish writings of the, the, the early 2nd century, um, in the late 1st century, how they were upset because they felt like, and they even wrote like the, the assertion is that, that parts of the Amidah were added in this point, the, the, the section against heretics was against the Christians. Because the Christians apparently, or these Yeshua followers, had, had brainwashed the Judean people and when this happened, people left their family. They ran. Bye, Mom. Bye, Dad. Bye, friends. <laughs> You're not going to stay and fight with us? You're not going to stay here and be with your family? Nope. Yeshua said, leave, so I'm leaving. It's a big deal. Big deal of what took place when this happened. Leaving your family. Yeshua talked about this. Imagine how your family felt. Yeshua brainwashed my son to be a traitor to his own people. This is, was the attitude, all right? For then there will, be, there will be a great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, then no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Who are the elect? The elect is like this new, these new human beings, these new people of God that are emerging with a new redefined mission of what it means to walk out the image of God, right? The elect. These followers proclaiming God's kingdom. And so did you see this? How many of you guys kind of raised your eyebrows when we read that? Right? There's like a shift in the atmosphere, right? So like, like Yeshua is just talking about something that is happening near within the next 40 years. But now he's like talking about something that sounds like it's far off, right? All right? And he did this with like no cues. He just goes into it. What just happened? This is, goes in hand with apocalyptic literature. Jewish prophet, right? Hebrew prophet. Talking like a Hebrew prophet. And there's a lot of different views in this chapter. And some of you may have those views, and that's okay, and, and we're going to talk about those, and, and I'm sure you've heard some. There's two main thoughts in Christian academia with scholars, men who, who love Yeshua with all their heart and have devoted their lives to following God and studying the languages. And there's two main thoughts, and one thought is that Yeshua is talking about Jerusalem, and he's intertwined randomly thoughts about his coming at the end of the age. And this is one thought that many men who have big acronyms at the end of their names believe and assert. And then there's the other view, same group of men, but a little bit different view, that Yeshua is answering the first question. And that possibly when Yeshua is, is um, quoting proto-apocalyptic poetry from Jeremiah and Isaiah, that maybe we're not understanding totally what we're reading. But there will be a great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, will never be. I humbly come before you as having this history of being on this side of the opinion. And I kind of lean towards this side of the opinion that Yeshua is orderly speaking about the questions, and I'll tell you why. Um, because this phrase is frequently used in the Hebrew Scriptures. It was this big, like nothing you've ever seen and nothing you will ever see. It happens like 10 or 11 times in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, so if I was to say, uh, this is hyperbole, extreme exaggeration to make a point. So if I was to say my favorite car was a BMW E30 model, and there is no other car that is ever going to be made better than that one, 
Would you give me a little bit of grace? Like, I mean, of course he's not saying that, like, another greater car. I mean, Tesla's obviously, like, a cooler car than this big old boxy, ugly 1980s car. But you give me a little bit of grace because I'm trying to make a point of, of what I'm trying to impress on you, right? I caught, a, I caught the biggest fish ever caught. Hey, yeah, we know you didn't, but you give me a little bit of grace, right? And then when it comes to the scriptures, no grace. <laughs> no. Exodus 11.6 states, And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall it ever be any more. Thus says the Torah of God. Well, Matthew 24 just kind of said that, like, the greatest tribulation is coming then, and nothing's ever been like it, and nothing ever will be. So did Yeshua just contradict Torah? Or do we just not know what we're reading? Context. We're going to have fun with this. So Solomon is known in 2 Kings 3.12 as, So that there was none like thee before thee, neither shall, there be, shall any arise like unto thee. So this is talking about King Solomon. There's never been a king, a person like him, and never will there be anyone like him until 15 chapters later when King Hezekiah comes on the scene. So that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Hezekiah. Oh, then Josiah comes on the scene just a few chapters later. And like unto him was there no king before him, neither after him arose there any like him. So is the Bible wrong? Should we just throw it out? Because obviously it's contradicting itself. No, it's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole. It, it, it's something that's common throughout the scriptures. Just like Yeshua talking about plucking your eye out. We give him grace, right? How about this one? You want one that'll get your attention? This will prove the point in the biblical narrative. Oh, I don't have it. Here we go. Luke 14, 26. Yeshua speaking. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. So unless you hate your kids, you can't follow Yeshua. Thus the words of Yeshua. Do we think that Yeshua is literally saying we got to hate everybody? Everybody in our life, even ourselves. I mean, it's just over. Hate everything. Hate, 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 hate everything. In order to be his disciple? Or was he using hyperbole to get our, did it get your attention? What? Yeah. To reveal the measure of what it takes to follow him. He sure doesn't want us to hate everybody. Please don't take away that away from this message. Jerusalem's the capital of Israel, right? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Was it special? Was Zion special? Why? What was in it? His name was there. What was built there? The temple. The shrine of heaven kissing earth where God's presence was intimately manifest. And this is kind of a huge deal. Huge deal. And God is going to allow its destruction in an effort to confront the evil and injustice that dwells in the world. Is that radical? Wow. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ. Or there he is. Do not believe it. For false prophets will rise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, even those who have committed themselves to proclaiming this new creation into the world. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. And if they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe him. And before it is the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, the vultures will gather. Luke 17, 24, uh, it says this a little bit differently. It says, for the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be, and then in some documents it says, in his day. So I love that. A little bit different take. Blessing, a people of blessing, a people who love, a people who meet the world of darkness head on and overtake it, just like Yeshua did. 
but not with swords, not with guns, not with corrupt or political agendas, but with love. Gosh, that sounds so hippie. Yeshua was more radical than a hippie. More. Talking to Pontius Pilate, if my kingdom was of this world, you'd be dead right now. Like, you'd have knives in you. Like, man, we'd take care of this. But my kingdom is not of this world. And we're not going to use the same pagan tactics to expand the kingdom of heaven like you do in Rome. Fascinating. This is a new kind of people, a new kind of human being that's being born in this image, this perfect image of God, a people that take up the vocation of blessing all nations. If you are in Christ, you are the seed of... Messiah is giving advice. Who's he giving it to? You. And he's saying, listen, the world is messed up. It's broken. It's falling apart. The false prophets and the Tishals will come about. And they will say things like, for your donation of $50, you too can get the blessing of God. Right? I wish Fit could do that. All we can do is send you a DVD to say thank you. Like, <laughs> for a donation, we'll send you all the blessings of God. Or here's a good one. Has any, have any of you guys ever bought a book that was talking about a coming prophecy in like the next six months? Right? Get this book if you want to know about these biblically based prophecies, right? And you read it, and it's like, oh man, this is coming, and the year goes by, and it's like, when's it coming? What about following Yeshua? Fear. We buy stuff to comfort ourselves in times of distress, and we watch videos to try to find out what is going to happen so we can at least feel like we're prepared to face it buy DVDs with big epic music playing in them because we allow fear to take over our lives and we're distracted from the mandate of what Yeshua told us to go do. If we allow fear to drive our lives, it just goes to show that we truly do not believe God has a handle on history. What about the big government conspiracy that's against God? Are you Jesus Christ? Like, like were you mandated to fight the government that's going to buck up and conspiracy theories to try to change the Bible? or No, we were called to go forth and teach all nations about Yeshua and stand as an ambassador. We do these things because we don't believe what Yeshua said. And he said, hang on, endure, stay focused. Stay focused on building the kingdom that I'm proclaiming. This is the gospel. Wake up. Right? That's what he's saying. <laughs> Stand firm, love God, love Yeshua, love people. Show that the world, show that to the world and bear witness to the hope in Yeshua that he is king. Yeshua is king, right? Is Yeshua king? Yes. Nothing can conquer that. Nothing. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all tribes on the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven for great power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Hmm. Okay, because, like, here he goes again, talking about the end of the world, obviously. That's what this is talking about, right? I mean, this has to be the end of the world. So the guys over here, they have to have a great opinion, and have a lot of weight in their opinion. But the issue, the issue is verse 34, like the very next section of verses, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Why has that verse got to be there? Why has that verse got to be there after it says this? Maybe we're not understanding something. There are people that read this chapter and believe Yeshua was speaking of the end here. 
in verse 34. There are people out there who say that Yeshua believed that the end of the age was coming in the next generation. C.S. Lewis is one of those people. Love, awesome writer. And he says, I threw the quote in this morning, their master had told them so, that this is going to come in this last generation, right? He shared, indeed, created their delusion. He said in so many words, this generation shall not pass away till all these things are done, and he was wrong. It is certainly the most embarrassing verse in all the Bible. Call me stubborn. I don't think Yeshua was wrong. I think he was answering question number one. Most of your Bibles um, with this verse here we'll have a little footnote speaking about the chapter of Isaiah that we read earlier, Isaiah 13. And I'd like to, to kind of run through it real quick. Um, do I still have it? Here we go. And we can just skip down. Like you guys remember what it said, all this stuff, a woman in labor. Verse 10, for the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. Sun will be dark and it's rising. The moon will not shed its light. This is apocalyptic, proto-apocalyptic type of literature and poetry. It wasn't meant to be literal, but, but, I want to show you something that may make what Yeshua said and why he used this phrase even more, even, even deeper. And this is my opinion. This is what I believe. You don't have to believe this, <clears throat> because that's not the point of this message. The point of this message is that no matter what is going on in the world, do not be afraid, because these things have to come to pass. Okay? So, so, so what is this about? Verse 1. It's about what, what, what nation? Babylon. So this is, a, this is a story about how Babylon was so wicked and evil and God is going to overtake the Medes and, and he's going to wipe out Babylon. And Yeshua is quoting this for what nation? For what city is he using this quote for? Yeshua is using this quote about Babylon to describe Jerusalem because Jerusalem had become Babylon in his time. And he said, this will not stand. Evil and injustice has to be confronted now. And you can't stand on your status of being the place where my, my father's house is anymore. It's not my father. It's a house of din, a den of robbers. And it will be destroyed just like Babylon. I'm coming in the clouds of heaven. Here we go. I got to back up. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send out angels to sound the trumpet, or with the sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather the elect together. So, you'll see the, the Son of Man. Um, in Mark chapter 14, Yeshua is drugged into the temple, and he's, 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 he's face to face with the high priest. And the high priest wants to know, he's like, listen, did you say all these things? Didn't you say you're going to destroy the temple? Like, who do you think you are to have reign over the temple and to make decisions of the temple? I'm the high priest. I'll make those decisions. And he's trying to pit this against Yeshua. And Yeshua was claiming to be inadvertently, indirectly, sometimes directly, the Messiah. What's that mean? What's Christos mean? The king. Who said king? The anointed king. The king, the messianic king. Christos means king. Messiah means king. Whenever you see Jesus Christ, it means Jesus the king, Yeshua Messiah, King Yeshua. And so on one side, and you have, if, you, if you understand the Hasmonean history, on one side you have the high priest pitted against the king of Israel for the authority over Israel. Right? This is exactly what took place with the uh, Hasmoneans because they took the kingship onto them and the priesthood. Anyway. And, and, and Yeshua responds in verse 62 of, of Mark 14. He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And, and I grew up in Sunday school always thinking, we grew up in Sunday school thinking, he's coming in the clouds of heaven, and he's riding down from heaven in the clouds. He's the cloud rider, and I do believe that. Um, that's another topic. But he's coming down to earth, right? He's coming down to earth on his cloud chariot, right? What prophet is Yeshua quoting when he says that? He's quoting Daniel. Apocalyptic literature, right? Purely. 
And he's specifically speaking about Daniel chapter 7. And it's a long message, so I'm not going to read through John chapter 7, but I want you guys to read Daniel chapter 7. And I'd like to offer you a set of lenses. And essentially, in Daniel chapter 7, there's like four beasts, but then there's one beast, and this is a really gnarly, nasty-looking beast, and got this horn and all this mess, right? And, and this beast wears out the saints. They, he wears out the elect, Israel, if you will. And the Son of Man is mentioned as this representative. How many of you guys know that the Messianic king was supposed to represent Israel and vice versa? That's why uh, like when anti-missionaries come and they're like, oh, that verse in the Old Testament has to do with Israel, not Messiah. It does, but it has to do with Messiah. They're both. That's why even in Matthew, when it speaks about uh, prophecies that have to do with Israel, that's why he took that. He was Israel, and he was fulfilling the mandate that Israel was always supposed to do, and he died as Israel on behalf of Israel to raise Israel to life as a new people. Okay? So when we see he's wearing out the saints, you've got this big beast, and he's just stomping all over these elect people, and the Son of Man is a part of that. Just, uh, 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 uh. And then something, something happens. Because at one point it says that God's seated. He puts out the thrones, it's plural, and God sits down. And he lets this beast do his thing for a time, and then he takes the authority away. And who does he give it to? He gives it to the Son of Man that had been worn out and oppressed and had endured the wrath of this beast. And the Son of Man comes coming on the cloud of heaven, the clouds of heaven, to the Ancient of Days to receive the power and authority in heaven and earth, to rule and have dominion over nations, and to sit down at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. Coming on the clouds of heaven isn't, according to Daniel chapter 7, is not in the context of coming from heaven to earth. It's from coming to earth to be vindicated into heaven. When this happens, good gracious, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect with the four winds of the earth, if you will, and one end of heaven to the other. Answer in verse 1, the Greek word for angelos. Angelos is a word that sometimes in the New Testament means a divine figure from heaven. Many times in the New Testament, it simply means messenger. The same thing as it does in the Hebrew, the messengers that came. So he, Yeshua, after he takes his position and authority, sitting at the right hand of the Father with all authority in heaven and earth, will send out his messengers to gather together the new people of God to all nations and all earth. That's your job. You're the angelos. You're the people of God that are dispatched to all nations, to every corner of the earth, to proclaim the new creation that everybody is and that they can be in Yeshua. Proclaiming that there is a new king that is reigning right now. And when you get to all nations, just endure with the message that the king has given to you. Or you can believe this is the rapture. <laughs> Ten virgins. Five of them lived with an anticipation of the coming bridegroom. They made sure that they had their oil ready. They made sure that they lived every day with intention of who they were as a new, renewed human being in Yeshua carrying out the mandate of being an image bearer of the God of creation, tending to creation, and proclaiming that God's reign is among us now. It is being birthed into this world. Do you want to experience it? and Do you want to be, be part of a kingdom that is not of this earth, just like Philippians says? They made sure that everything that they could do was taken care of, and they made sure that nothing was done without expectation and the hope of the bridegroom calling them. And five did not. Five got distracted, if you would let me, by fear or by junk. They got distracted by false prophets. They got distracted by conspiracies. They got distracted by whatever. They got apathetic about creation and their mandate. They didn't live with the intention of being called the bridegroom. Any time now, are we going to be ready? Are we living our life out always with extra oil, or are we not? And they didn't care, and they didn't keep up. And the bridegroom looked at the five that did not live with the intention of who they were. 
as the ambassadors of the king. And he said the haunting words, I don't know you. I don't know you. The very next verse. Oh, yeah. First Peter 3.22 may help with the whole Daniel 7 thing. Who has gone up into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is a fulfillment of Daniel 7. Peter attested this of many of the verses in the New Testament. No, but, verse 36, but after that day and hour no man knows, neither the angels of heaven for the Son, nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man. In verse 36, he begins to answer question number two. And despite your view on whether Yeshua is speaking, truly speaking about both Jerusalem and the end of the world, or just Jerusalem, um, that he addressed later in the chapter, uh, his message was to focus on him, despite what you see in this world and what is coming in this world. Focus on him now, right now, and tomorrow, and the day after. Do not be afraid. Hold on and endure. Because these things have to come to pass. And that is something that is echoed through every generation until the things after verse 36 start taking place. We are part of the birthing of the kingdom into the now, into this world. That's what ambassadors are. And so I want you to walk away today knowing that one thing. That your mandate is to focus on what you have been given and to walk that out with intention. Amen? Hey everybody, I'm Matthew Vanderels, pastor at Founded in Truth Fellowship. And if you enjoyed this message and would like to see more messages like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here. If you'd like more information about what we do and who we are, or if you'd like to partner with us to make a donation, you can do so with this link right here. Hope you guys have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Shalom.